<laughs> oh man, look who's back. Look who's back. JG. <laughs> <laughs> Me? <laughs> yeah, you, bro. Okay, so hi everybody. Let's see who's going to who's going to jump on board and join this is a virtual conversation so that we don't feel like we're speaking into a vacuum or talking into the void. <laughs> okay. So here's what's going on. The title of this post is impregnating the world with mind okay now it's a very visual metaphor and the reason for that uh, is by design because I want to make you think of something that's very uh, very visual when you try to understand what I'm talking about so what does it mean to impregnate <laughs> what does it mean to impregnate the world with mind well Think of your think of your childhood. You're a little kid and let's say you grew up in a house with a really big yard. So you have that huge perimeter of private property in your backyard and you go to your backyard to play, right? One of the things that happy childhoods are known for is for instances of deep play. So you're in your backyard, your private property, your kingdom so to speak and your parents say go play so then you go play wizards and warriors or you get dressed up as a cowboy or you get dressed up as a superhero or a space explorer and the garden the landscape the backyard becomes the canvas for your imagination you essentially impregnate the world with mind so even though you're out in a physical environment you might as well be dreaming Right? The whole definition of deep play means that the mind is allowed to become unbounded so that you can inhabit your imaginal daydreaming meanderings. That space of creativity that is characterized by deep play requires, I believe, open spaces that you are allowed to have some kind of imaginal ownership over and the biggest problem what thwarts what breaks the spell of deep play is consensus reality so anytime that your game is interrupted by somebody else's game so to speak so it's the the other kids from the other street that come over and say what are you doing and they come make fun of you and they thwart the game and so one of the difficulties from you know, in being creative in these increasingly oppressive cityscapes in which we dwell is that the sort of surveillance state mentality and the paranoia about terrorism and the fear of sticking out has created a generation of highly neurotic beings who are constantly holding back right from expressing themselves in any meaningful capacity making it so that we essentially are 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 Ugh, in or living with a state of perpetual anxiety for fear of expressing ourselves for fear of being um untethered from consensus trance and you know i'm not the first one to say this robert anton wilson back in the 60s used to talk about being stuck in these reality tunnels you know timothy leary talked about the eight circuits of human consciousness you know he used to say that we are like larvas we haven't turned ourselves into butterflies yet so even though we each have the capacity to soar to overcome to transcend to be imaginal beings to create radiant poetic spaces in which new ideas and visions and vistas can emerge and can be born, we are nonetheless living in a quasi-schizophrenic state in city-states in which we are both the prisoners and the guards, like they talk about in that movie, My Dinner with Andre. And it's, it's a really horrible thing. You know, there's so much innovation that comes out of the density of cities, but there's also this oppressive in, in, in sort of imposition of consensus that sometimes I find to be just... Oh man, just uh, like a like a straitjacket for the mind, you know. And so the the repressed exuberance that we carry around manifests itself in the symptoms of anxiety, and that's why it's important again to find spaces that you will be uninterrupted and that you can impregnate with your mind. <laughs> what do you think, Jay Good? Obviously, I've been trying to get this stuff off my chest for a couple of days, but I've been traveling and giving talks and haven't been feeling free enough and untethered enough to do it. JG. I think that's, you're speaking volumes. That it sound, <laughs> sounds like you've had a, you've been holding down fort all week. <laughs> exactly. You know? But then, but then now I feel like I'm, uh, this is like therapy for me, like talk therapy. You know how you feel better when you get it out? 
So what do you think I should do? Should I just like live between Tulum and Amsterdam? <laughs> <laughs> well, you do feel, in being there with you, in those places, you do feel most free there. So I, I do, you, right? If you could figure that out, you'd be quite happy. I mean, it would become all playground, you know? We're going to go there in a couple days. I mean, look, you're a key example of an artist, right, who needed to find spaces that he could impregnate with his mind. There's a reason <laughs> you left New York. There's a reason you live in a rural, beautiful, smaller town in Maine, right? Because yeah. there's more... You can go be yourself, right? Yeah, there's more time, yeah. You focus on your on your flow, yeah. More instances of deep play. Yeah. So talk a little bit about why, you know, um, sort of the, the cognitive benefits of travel is that it allows you to sample, like a tapas bar, different ways of living, some that may be more free than others. Why do you think places like the Netherlands with their bicycle infrastructure, their highly tolerant attitudes towards foreigners and towards cognitive liberty and towards things like cannabis create a space in which actual public spaces feel almost as free as your private big backyard from your childhood? Because growing up in Venezuela, I had a really big backyard and I felt really free. When I go to Amsterdam, the public spaces feel as free as my backyard did in Venezuela. Like, it's one of the few countries and cities where I just feel so, um, like I can be myself. Oh, look, we got private service coming. Thank you, Proxy. Thank you very much. We're doing a Facebook Live. You are welcome to chime in if you like. No, okay. Never mind. Never mind. So, JG, what do you think? Why do you think that Amsterdam, what do you think is about the, the, onto, the ontology of the way that city is being designed? The ontological design, because, you know, humans build spaces and spaces build humans. <laughs> what is it about cities like that? And I hear other Scandinavian cities like that always get the top of the list for all for happiness indexes. People just live happier lives by every measurable indicator in some of these countries. And, you know, what does that tell us that we can learn from in these hyper capitalist, soul stifling often societies? I think that Amsterdam has, you know, it was built for the speed of the bicycle. So sure. You know, that's still, I think that's still a little fast for some people to get there and there's bikes everywhere. And yeah, it is, it is, it is its own, it is its own thing, its own mm -hmm. speed. But once mm -hmm. you get in that speed, mm -hmm. it's a great, it's a great pace to be mm -hmm. moving around fast and it's so healthy. It changes your relationship with space. The Thanks, whole, man. the whole urban landscape. You know, a, a, an urban landscape designed for the bicycle and a bicycle that is designed for the urban landscape creates a nice coupling, and right? Quieter, and that too. coupling, you know, people don't realize that consciousness is a dance between the subjective and the objective. Like, you become what you behold. You are some of your surroundings and the people you spend time with. And so subtle design cues and city design end up informing the very nature of conscious thought. So your very subjective experience actually is sort of massaged and sustained by the ontology of the designed spaces around you, the cognitive impact of the designed spaces and structures and culture. And so when you're there, you just enter a different flow. You are flying through the urban landscape, and that is therapeutic. One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately is actually um, the ways in which our pathologies emerge when these conditions are not met, when the necessary conditions for creative expression, for the mind to feel untethered and free, um, when those things are not met, when those conditions are not met, what happens? What is the pathology that emerges? And I tell you from personal experience, so I've dealt with tremendous amounts of anxiety in my life, whether it was Venezuela running away from the fear of like getting kidnapped or mugged or home invasions, which are very common in poor countries, especially if you happen to live in a nice home which we did. Um, so there was that anxiety and fear. And then there was like the hypochondriacal anxiety of fear. You know, I, I just, I, I'm a secular Jew and I grew up thinking about, you know, the human condition and philosophy and existentialism and why are we do and what are we here for? And what is this thing called death? And so there's been that anxiety. And then now there's the anxiety of just like wanting to be creative and do something inspiring and feeling the pressures of consensus. Like, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live? You're supposed to get married or you're supposed to move into this house or you're supposed to get a response this and that. I mean, everybody can deal with that. It's Lester Burnham in American Beauty talking about growing increasingly sedate from the soul-stifling constriction of the designed reality in which we live. I mean, there was an article in New York Magazine called The Psychological Impact of Boring Buildings. Just buildings alone designed to stifle the spirit, yeah. create more cortisol, stress us out. So, again... <laughs> I think that anxiety, I think that OCD, I think that depression, I think all these things are afflictions. They're side effects of bad, bad design. And I think that because our cells 
are a technology that turns experience into biology. Who we are and how we unfold is determined by the creative and linguistic choices that we make and also by the environments in which we dwell. And so when you hear that 70 million Americans are on medications for anxiety, even though we live in the most quote unquote abundant time in human history, you start to realize that something is fundamentally wrong with how we are living our lives. There is an emptiness, there is a fire in the belly, there is a nodding resignation into nothingness. And so what do we do? Let us sedate ourselves with Xanax because how oppressive to try to question a system that's already oppressing you. And so it's like, oh, it's like, mm. So I've been thinking a lot about this and you know, you start reading books about all the pathologies that emerge when you're anxious, sensory motor obsessions, OCD. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty fucked up. And so there's this hunger now for transformation from within. People are taking psychedelics, ayahuasca in droves. People are going to Mexico and taking magic mushrooms. People are talking about cannabis, something that for a second allows you to enter a state of contemplative bliss and disconnect from the always on constant interruption demands of modern life. And oof, if I sound a little manic, it's because obviously I've been holding this in for a couple of days, but too many people are leading lives of quiet desperation and it saddens me. What do you think, JJG? You got me thinking about, you know, J.P. Morgan, Edison, uh, you know, Rockefeller, if, if they had been interested in making everything free for our society and, and like, you know, set things up with that intention, it would be a little bit more like Amsterdam. Like, you know? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, it, this is supposed to be the place of individual liberty and freedom, but I don't know. I just feel like... I don't know. I feel. I mean, I, I'm attracted to things like universal basic income, even though I've growing up in Venezuela and and hating everything that Hugo Chavez stood for with like you know this statist totalitarianism and shutting down civil liberty. So I I grew up a sort of hyper capitalist because Venezuela didn't work. I saw America as the holy grail, capitalism and toys and things, and you could buy things and all those things are awesome but like you know in the movie Fight Club they say the things you own end up owning you I think there's something there's sort of the next level beyond that which is like can we use our tech tools and technologies and our abundance to give people basic needs so take care of the basic needs to eliminate the existential dread of basic health and basic education and where to sleep that night and once you get rid of those basic existential dread things then there's the next wave of existential dread which is what the fuck do I do with my life what am I going to do what is going to be my hero's journey but at least that journey when you don't have to to worry about meeting basic needs is an exciting journey to take you know and so i think that we could learn from the way that countries like Copenhagen, you know uh, the denmark copenhagen amsterdam the netherlands all these places um take care of some of these basic needs for people and you know some switzerland i think was talking about maybe experimenting with universal basic income but i i don't know i just feel like you know, if we're going to get to this technological singularity, like there needs to be something that we can do to better take care of our people, to alleviate the pressures that make them work jobs they hate, to buy things they don't need. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess I'm in agreement with this idea that what is needed is a shift in consciousness, and sometimes the lack of it makes me nauseous. Hmm. <sighs> Letting off some steam with Jason G. <laughs>